Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining and welcome to today's webinar on private networks for manufacturing. We'll be also exploring the automotive use case with our special guest, STF Gruppe, who is uh, one of the leading system integrators and telecommunications and tech companies from Germany. We are very glad that STF Gruppe was willing to join us for this webinar and share the knowledge and expertise with us. So big thanks belongs to them. So let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Daniel. I work at Ivy Wave in marketing. <clears throat> and I would also like to welcome our speakers, Ralph Burkhardt from Ivy Wave. Welcome, Ralph. Yes, hi there, everyone. My name is Ralph Burkhardt from Ivy Wave. I'm sales engineer at Ivy Wave since almost eight years and more than or close to 30 years in the telecommunication business. I'm happy to host this webinar today, and uh, yeah, it's a sunny day here in Germany, so I hope it's the same at your end. Thanks. Thank you, Ralph. And I would also like to welcome our co-speaker, Viktor Piachev from STF Gruppe. Welcome, Viktor, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Daniel, for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon for everyone on the bridge. Uh, I'm a wireless engineer working here for STF Gruppe. Uh, last three years, I'm really focused on the industrial networks. Uh, hope I can uh, discover some interesting points for you. For you. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Victor. So our speakers are going to talk about um, the basics of private networks and also the main benefits of deploying private networks for manufacturing. And we'll also cover some main challenges that come with it. Uh, Victor will also take a closer look on the automotive use case and then we'll end the session with a live Ivy Wave demo and your questions. So just before we get started, I would like to go with you through a few housekeeping items. So today's webinar is going to be recorded and you'll receive the recording in your email within the next few days. And I would also like to encourage you to ask your questions using the side panel and we'll answer those questions at the end of the session. And for those that we won't be able to answer today, uh, we'll get back to you by email within a day or so and also if you have any follow-up questions please don't hesitate and uh, reach out to sales at ibwave.com and we'll get back to you as soon as possible so that's all from me for now and i'm gonna hand it over to ralph yeah Enjoy. thanks daniel so i think the agenda you already mentioned that daniel it's a quick introduction to private networks at all and uh, a very very cool use case presented by stf on automotive a little bit of sneak preview on the uh, new features at IB Wave, which are coming, and then hopefully a lot of Q&A at the end. So let's start. So we have limited time only. The first thing is all about private networks, the basics. So why do you need as an enterprise deploy private networks, especially for manufacturing? So what, what are the key challenges in manufacturing environments? And um, this is, uh, yeah, this is always the question. And uh, uh, by luck, uh, everything, everything starts with a big C, as you can see there. Yeah? So it's, it's uh, courage, or you could say connectivity, which is required in, uh, in manufacturing areas, especially to, yeah, to get access to the end devices, yeah? to uh, capacity to download maybe over the air software to the end devices. In some cases, there is only a small capacity or ca uh, uh, throughput required. Um, because you just need to control them, but in other cases, you need very, very high data rates. Yeah? So it's control over your own network. Yeah? You need to be able to control all the machinery inside to automate all the processes uh, in the production, in the logistics, and the, the big C cost. Yeah? It's, I mean, it's all about cost at the end. Yeah? If you can automate processes and uh, that, that, that will reduce the cost at all at the end. Yeah? So cloud integration might be another topic yeah? um, because all these smart buildings, smart manufacturing with IoT devices and everything should be integrated in a cloud. Right? So I already said smart, so it's smart factory. Yeah? We are looking about industry 4.0. So many countries, they already have a high level of industrial automation. Um, but I mean, you need to, uh, to find you know, innovative ways to uh, be competitive in the market. Right? You need to automate your processes and you need to respond very quickly to any changes in the market. Yeah? And uh, because it's like, if you look, for example, at this specific case today, automotive, 
the uh, the manufacturing area will probably change a lot to, during a year or maybe next year yeah because they they have to manufacture a different car so they have, they have to reassemble everything so it's it's not static yeah it's 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 moving uh, and you have to adapt to the new uh, challenges yeah? and um there, there are a lot of IoT devices, and there, there's uh, you have these autonomous machines. You have augmented reality now. Yeah? Yes, that's coming, and it's it's already there. So you need to have a network which supports it. Yeah? So that's the industry 4.0. They all depend on extremely reliable um, networks with low latency at the lowest possible cost at the end. Yeah? So a proper network design will make sure that you meet all these requirements. Maybe um, that's a good time to have a quick survey, a quick poll um, about private networks at all. Yeah? So Daniel will just uh, uh, start a poll and you can, you can uh, just, let's see if that's now, now it's, it should be there for you in the, uh, in the box. Yes, the poll is now live. Uh, yes, we'll give now it. it's live. Thanks, Daniel. It's, it's there. So you can just click on the uh, on the item uh, on the box. It's about private networks. If you are working at all with private networks, and specifically for today's topic, which is a very interesting automotive. I mean, there, there are other uh, manufacturing uh, or private networks like uh, logistics. Yeah? Um, if you have um, maybe a large harbor with lots of containers, that's more logistics. Um, uh, so let's just have the poll a few seconds open to see uh, who has experience already with private networks and uh, specifically the automotive part. Yes, Ralph. So we have about 70% who voted and okay. we have 32% yes, 68% no. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. That's a good feedback. And uh, let's continue with the uh, with yeah, the enterprise. Right, so, ah, sorry, I'll yes. launch the second poll. Uh, that's about if you have experience with designing private networks in manufacturing. Ah, that's the same. Didn't, didn't see that here. <laughs> so not not popping up at my site. <laughs> no worries. But well, that's cool. So hopefully, we do have um, not only IBWave users, but uh, a lot of. Uh, 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 participants from the industry which are looking for solutions yeah? because that's that's a big new market here um, automation is so important and uh, you need to design your networks future proof yeah? so there might be 5g now maybe it's still 4g is a good technology to be used on uh, in factories yeah? but uh, now we do have the 5g and the 6g is coming so you need to design networks for future proof yeah? All right, so we have also 70% voted and we have 18% voted yes and 82% voted no. Cool. Thanks for that, Daniel. Sure. Okay, cool. So let's let's go to the, the next one, which, which is uh, all about the private network. So it's a connected connectivity driven ecosystem. Yeah? So you have employees over there, yeah, which might log into the private network only they might log into the mobile uh, 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 public network operator yeah so both is possible yeah? um, but the most important here in this manufacturing uh, uh, area is the uh, the static iot and the mobile iot so the static ones these are the sensors uh, uh, cameras displays cameras probably they do not move around you. Yeah? Um, they're, they're static, yeah? but still you need to transmit all that on uh, with high data rates. Yeah? Um, the mobile uh, IoT devices, these are vehicles, which might be automated guided vehicles or maybe not, yeah? but they're moving. Yeah? So that's a very, very important part here. We have uh, maybe visitors, uh, other users, which you allow to log into the private networks, maybe not. Yeah? Maybe they should stick to the uh, mobile network operators. Um, and you have service providers. There might be a public safety network already there. You know, you, you need in large campus areas, you need to have public safety like Tetra or P25. Yeah? Um, just in, in case of emergency, you need to make sure that 
somebody knows where the guy is who has a problem. So we need to have networking. And uh, so it's a really connectivity-driven ecosystem, which makes it more complex than just a, a standard project like a hotel, for example. Right? So what is the big difference here in technology? So what should you use there? It's Wi-Fi, it's industrial 5G. I mean, you could use 4G as well, yeah? but now we have 5G ready. So it's the newest technology. And if you start with a new network, you, you should deploy the newest technology. And uh, the big, big difference, you can see that in the table here, but industrial 5G is the reliable uh, technology, really, which enables you uh, all uh, reliable production processes, logistic processes, it gives you the control over your own data. And that's really, really important. It, you own the data at the end because it, it's your private network. And um, the flexibility to configure it. So if you give it to someone public or even Wi-Fi, that's more, uh, uh, it's not your own license, yeah? um, then you don't have the flexibility really to configure your network as per your need and your requirements. Um, so that's really important, I think, for the industrial 5G. And the, uh, at the end, what you get is ultra low latency, important, specifically for auto, auto, uh, automotive sector, and a very high reliability. Uh, you have the, uh, um, you have uh, the uh, capabilities really to transmit data very, very fast, reliable uh, to your devices. So it's all about the key performance indicators. It's about high data rates, huh? it's low latency, maybe low battery lifetime as well. Uh, uh, sorry, not low, long battery lifetime, <laughs> because you, uh, with a good network coverage, you can increase your battery lifetime. So you have really reliable network at the end, a secure network, which allows you um, that you have the full control of it. Huh? So these are the, the really reasons why we should go for industrial 5G. Um, IDWave offers full solution for you to design your network, but as well to document it, to digitalize your network, and to serve it, your, your private network. Yeah? Uh, it might be greenfield, it might be nothing there uh, on site uh, where you can do a survey, but if it's an existing building, you can survey it, you can uh, find out the, uh, the different materials used in the in the uh, in the building itself. So that's that's really important. Um, you can measure already. You can measure the existing networks. So that would be inf interference. Um, but even for greenfield, um, I mean, you you can get a lot of information that, uh, there. Maybe then you have to use uh, existing plans from from the landlord. You know, um, to design your network as per customer requirements. And once it's designed, you need to verify your network as well. Mm -hmm. Verify network means that you need to do a site acceptance, check if all your key performance indicators, what you agreed with the customers are met. Uh, so you pass them. And at the end, you want to have a digital copy, a twin of your built network, not the designed one, the built one, which is actually out in the field. Yeah? So you really need to know where are my antennas, small cells, cables, where is this installed? So you want to have the inventory and this should be digital just in case you do modifications, you move something around at a later stage, you want to have that digital so it's easy to control and configure at any time. And at the end, you have to maintain your private network. So there's operations, field technicians, if something goes wrong, you, you have to go there yeah, and fix it. Um, so all that is in private manufacturing areas, you probably have lots of metal there. And that's where uh, Victor is talking about uh, a lot in his presentation. So um, this, is, this makes it really, really, really complex. What you want to achieve is, in most of the cases, capacity, traffic, good performance, low interference. Huh? And how to do that? Because you, you used network elements like the antennas, yeah? they, they, the antenna pattern might change very, very fast if there's an unexpected uh, 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 ABG passing by yeah? or cars passing by, then your antenna pattern could be completely different. So you need to take care of these, these things. Yeah? And uh, that's, that's very important for uh, all the technologies, if it's Wi-Fi or it's, uh, it's 5G. Yeah. So the, really the challenges are regulation. You need to uh, 
take care about your license uh, regulations. So you should not transmit uh, with a certain field strength over the border of your campus area because that's the license you pay for. Um, so it's the spectrum allocation you have. And maybe there's EMF, electromagnetic fields. You need to make sure that the safety distance to the radiating antennas, mobile cells, is met. Yeah? And all that our iWave solution will support you in that because that's that's important. Security is really, really important. And you will see uh, in Victor's presentation uh, um, the, the, the coverage uh, um, together with all the restrictions you can see here. Um, this is really important to design, to take care into your design. Mm -hmm. So finally, it's as well about the spectrum. You have 5G spectrum in low frequency bands, the sub-6, which is called FR1, and you have millimeter wave band, very high frequency in FR2. And how do they behave? Yeah? So um, the, low, the lower frequencies, they will give you better coverage because of the radio wave propagation inside the buildings. The higher frequencies, you need maybe to, to place additional antennas, small cells, because uh, you, you only have good signal when you are in line of sight condition. Yeah? On the other hand, the, this sub-6, frequency bands, the bandwidth is lower than in the millimeter wave band. So the millimeter wave band gives you more bandwidth, more throughput compared to the sub six. But on the other hand, the uh, yeah, signal losses are much, much higher. So it might be as well a good combination, combine a sub six with the millimeter wave band where you need very, very high uh, data rates. You go for the millimeter wave band and combine it with a sub six band. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, uh, I think, right time now to hand over to uh, a very cool use case from STF uh, to Victor. And uh, he will talk about the specific challenges, how to overcome all these uh, uh, challenges yeah, to design a high performance private network um, for a manufacturing use case. So, Victor, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so Daniel, can you can you please assign me as a presenter? Sure. One second. Should be good now. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Uh, so let me try to jump to presentation mode. Also jump back. Uh, yeah, thanks for the word, uh, Ralph. Yeah, I, I will have to be a little bit uh, compressed. Uh, recently, we have accomplished uh, one industrial project, and uh, all the slides I show to you, they are not an exercise. This is a real project, and uh, I prepared all of the slides for you to to highlight our let's say challenges and uh, sometimes lessons learned, sometimes conclusions, and. Uh, Please do not perceive this is the only possible way of realization, yes, uh, because uh, it's only one way we have investigated and proposed, and it very depends on what kind of uh, object you have and uh, what kind of discussion with customer you have. So I will talk about industrial area, which is a car assembly area, and uh, I will try to cover uh, four chapters at least, and we start uh, with the model as such, and then we continue with uh, RF challenges and calculations. So, of course, uh, the first step about modeling, uh, I have to mention that really unlike uh, all kind of indoor planning, like planning for stadiums, even for airports, and of course, unlike you plan something like Burger King, yeah, when you have uh, three AutoCAD files, and maybe one cross section, that's it, yeah. Here, when you go industrial, you go heavy, because uh, just to give you a taste, uh, it can be a combination of uh, 300, 500 uh, different uh, CAD files. And of course, there is not a case when all files combined in the way that you would construct uh, only relevant obstacles for, for wireless, yeah? <laughs> Which means that uh, you need to find a good compromise. This uh, term and compromise you will hear from me many times today because it's all about engineering, finding a good compromise. So first of all, to highlight that, Good accuracy, good model is important because uh, uh, if a model too simple, uh, of course your system can be underestimated and uh, too simplific and uh, you will understand it on, only on realization step. Of course, it will be too late. 
if for example you try to invest in your model like a lot of our really detailed it uh, it can become let's say less suitable for business department yeah so you always need to find this compromise our compromise was that <clears throat> to build a model in ibwave we were using also a kind of site survey in 3d uh, method yeah in 3d world which means uh, we had uh, access to models of revit and other tools yeah and uh, i had a chance really to look around what is where and then to agree also with the architecture of this building uh, what kind of components i shall take and how it can be important for for my model because of course my model first of all is uh, for wireless of course and which is less interest from architectural point of view so as I said, uh, model is compromised, and uh, after you build a reasonable model, uh, we selected, of course, uh, materials, everything, yeah, and uh, the model outlook you can see on this slide, and very briefly about the the model because uh, it's of course an obvious what is where. Of course, it's a large scale manufacturer. Imagine that distance from here to here is about 800 meters. Distance from here to here maybe about 400 meters, yeah. And in central areas, this is a storage area, this blue color, yeah? And uh, so to say, manufacturing is happening around the storage area. You may recognize even the conveyor lines here, yeah? And this green area, this is a special uh, machinery and supply chain for the conveyor. So interesting enough that there, there is a different uh, traffic demand for different areas, but we will talk about a little bit later about it. Uh, so, Victor, uh, uh, yeah. I think what you, the, the first topic is, uh, I think, the most interesting here as well. It's a metal forest. Uh, very, very interesting. Yeah. Because I think that that is the main difference between such a project and a, uh, as I said, maybe a hotel. Yeah? Um, you have lots of metal. So what what is really the impact here? Yeah, yeah, metallic forest, Ralph. You you are right. And uh, does it promise anything good for radio frequency for our for us for friends of wireless? Yeah. Obviously, not at all. Not at all, it doesn't promise anything good. Of course, this is really intensive uh, reflections and uh, intensive, uh, what I mean here, even the first uh, reflection, the second reflection, the force, the power is very high, which means, in fact, this is really mirror conditions. And uh, we see this picture and uh, it looks static for us, yeah? But imagine when you visit such a plant, everything is moving, so which means it's not only mirror type, uh, the mirror is changing its position which means it's constantly changing. And the second to it, uh, in this kind of uh, manufacturing, there are also a lot of electric motors. Yeah, <laughs> It can be part of soldiering. And all of those electric models and soldiering part adding sparks of noise. So this is extra. Yeah, And uh, on top, of course, thanks, what, thanks. What, yeah. <laughs> on top, of course, uh, moving assets, uh, they can really move close to the antennas. and. Uh, of course, we, we know all together that if you are really in the proximity of the, of the antenna, you are entering uh, near field, so-called near field of the antenna. So you can have uh, your diagram, your antenna diagram simply broken, distortion, yeah? And uh, all consequences, which can be later on, uh, that you can lose your coverage in the unexpected way. And uh, also, what is interesting to, to be aware about that, uh, uh, shield, shield boxes areas can be also can also happen in an expected way because sometimes when the moving assets they are moving yeah you can have a shadow like 30 decibels and uh, for a long time not not just for uh, or 20 seconds or 10 seconds it can be a half a day shadow or so so this is uh, difficulties yeah and uh, on this slide i present you kind of look from inside to the model but we have to we have to go further because quite a lot of slides to show about uh, yeah coverage co coverage as such and don't forget that here the picture is again is static but everything is moving and uh, it's in the way that when it is not moving which means it's not a manufacturer at all you can imagine i, I think what's, what's really important victor is what you have done really really great is to that everything which is rf relevant radio wave propagation relevant should be modeled in a proper way with the proper materials and as you can okay. see there are brick rolls there's the uh, concrete uh, all the different materials are used and they are all in the ibf database already there so if uh 
uh, if something is not in our database, you can create and model your own materials so that you can have really, really a digital twin as said uh, with uh, with reality. Yeah. Yeah. So, correct. Thank. You. Thank. You. Yeah, and we we then let's let's go forward and uh, of course uh, from RF uh, planning perspective, the first uh, check and verification we did. This is uh, safety distance for the antenna. Uh, maybe you remember this uh, long corridor from the slide, which is a uh, model overview, yeah? Here is this uh, long corridor. And uh, of course, uh, we made experiment what would be safety distance to the antenna or his, uh, different, uh, with different uh, output power on the antenna. So depending on ERP, we have investigated this. And here quickly, you can see also legend the blue, light blue colors, this is a very strong signal. Uh, green is also very reasonable and uh, low levels is like yellow and, and red here, yeah? And uh, it was very important to check this uh, safety distance because you can imagine uh, the antenna which would be installed near conveyor line, they can appear to be really in the proximity of the personal. And of course, the first for us, in input was, uh, first input for us was that, okay, uh, how, uh, what is this, what is this distance can be for example can we place the antenna like 25 cent 25 centimeters uh, next to the personal yeah and this slide is a good bridge uh, for more uh, let's say deeper view to uh, let's say rf rf planning and challenges and uh, i guess that uh, on the on the first step uh, it is important before you really place antennas Agreement with customer is important. Uh, what kind of target you would like to have for RF, RF uh, planning? Yeah. So good design starts from from good input, and possibly all metrics here for input uh, it's more or less uh, well known for you. But I would stop only to highlight two of them. This is a high capacity demand for finish area where all the cars are being already prepared and the software really a big bulk of software is supposed to be downloaded it is a special area which immediately immediately tells us it shall be more than one sector and this is a special challenge later on i show you and the second interesting is this is coverage redundancy which means this is sort of what if scenario what what if if my antenna goes out what if two antenna goes out yeah in discussion with customer we have had this 30 percent overlapping uh, let's say scenario which would be initial scenario to consider and uh, i will i can tell you ahead that uh, this is very very sensitive uh, value end of the day for the amount of antennas so in this case victor this is an overlapping of cells yeah? so exactly yeah because if you have uh, as a safety margin let's say you do an overlapping of the different cells and this make it gives you the redundancy you need yeah, exactly. And uh, when we hear in uh, friends of wireless, yeah, we say overlapping of the cells that uh, typically a customer from industrial area, they say redundancy, which means they really want to be sure what if uh, antenna goes out, what, what happens after. Yeah. yeah. As uh, Ralph, you already mentioned, uh, we have, of course, uh, some uh, unpredictable scenarios like antenna shadows in the, in the proximity area. And uh, we uh, took additional margins, like uh, we decreased the, antenna power from 26 to 21 and uh, we took a fast fading margin margin also as you see here additionally three decibels so in in total we have uh, seven decibels of extra insurance i would say against of uh, different uh, scenarios which could not be uh, properly predicted in, in advance so here with this uh, slide i have uh, specially created this visualization i would call it uh, this way because uh, I wanted to give you really a taste of RF planning, and uh, maybe you you have it from from this slide, hopefully. Yeah. So you can see that here, even you probably do not see the antenna position itself. Yeah. But uh, likely you are able to see where this antenna would be added because here you may see the legend, uh, the blue and the light blue color. This is representing the most powerful signal the green is also very reasonable and uh, yellow and red part is a very low signal and uh, uh, this uh, let's say our work process starts that we assess uh, propagation in uh, different parts of our industrial industrial area yeah and uh, we are targeting about the conclusion for leakage 
and uh, for let's say propagation footprint because only in this way is possible to understand for example that um, pro propagation in this area was more complicated in comparison to propagation in this area but of, of course uh, the model shall be already developed in, in the good state and the, when you see here a red color this means okay this is no signal but in the same time it means okay it's very good isolated yeah so i think it's a very uh, good for understanding because if you see the red color which means which means this is a central area which is a storage area it's really separated from a ref point of view and uh, theoretically we can place a sectors there another problem that we don't need in the case yeah but you need to spot uh, such uh, such a conditions in order to achieve a good compromise uh, here uh, it's another type of visualization maybe another angle angle of visualization so you keep uh, focus uh, what kind of uh, footprint uh, can be achieved yeah and uh, you constantly try to imagine that okay this area can be assigned uh, to one one sector what if for example i try to build a dedicated sector here on the left side yeah what kind of leakage i shall expect uh, from left to right and here probably you can see that we have uh, quite a lot of uh, power here from left to right this is a green area and a little bit uh, less here and this is actually the good uh, the good step for uh, for compromise because if you observe that you would like to have a better separation between sectors and uh, you do not achieve it you may think about discussion with uh, let's say architectural department of the of the customer <laughs> even if it would be possible to install additional walls in there and this is probably it's new that's difficult for me victor so do we have some real real life experience with that uh yeah ralph you can imagine that uh, in this case in this example we were really discussing the wall here which would uh, help separation and i was uh, really pessimistic about this discussion but when we started with customers this discussion it appeared to be they are ready to consider and uh, they do have understanding that uh, not only wall can cost money but also capacity of 5g network can also cost money and that that's the chicken and egg question always uh, there's the building infrastructure first and then uh, we have to design on the network according to the building structure or can we adapt the building structure once we know how the network should look like yeah? so just adding yeah. a wall will help a lot in isolation yeah? Yeah, of course. And uh, here are the next three slides. I uh, simply I want to show you uh, during the, our work process we were experimenting. And for example, this one one of for me what okay. What if I put sector here? What kind of leakage I have from right to left? Okay. What if I put sector here? What kind of leakage I, I have? What kind of isolation? For example, central area is still really is isolated. I can put sectors there, and I keep in mind this compromise. You can imagine compromise between uh, coverage, uh, coverage as an R, I would say, capacity, amount of antennas, and very an, an obvious player here, building architecture. Because when you are using omni antennas, uh, what can help you to have a good isolation? And that not, would be my question. Then why not using yeah. direction antennas? I mean, you can eliminate the, maybe the back lobes and the side lobes. You can reduce, so you would have maybe pro perfect isolation if you use direction antennas. Yeah. Yeah, Ralph. Uh, I, I guess, I guess your question would deserve maybe three white papers, and we have less time. I, really, really quickly. So about Omni. Again, this is only for this particular industrial area, only valid for for let's say for this case. I think factor number one, uh, when we are using directional antennas, typical indoor antennas, directional, they are let's say not that uh, directional to say it's they are weakly directed, which means uh, this is when we say it's not phased array electronic beam formed yeah they really let's say not that the directivity factor is low back to back to uh, front to back ratio is, is really so so and end of the day uh, in together with reflections your footprint is not really better end of the day and and if you imagine okay we found a really good directivity antenna and then you try to cover the distance like three four times longer like maybe 300 meters you try to cover then really you create the risk if something uh, goes near to your antennas or proximity you are really immediately risking to lose this coverage yeah as well and 
the third factor, even if uh, it happens that you found really good directional antenna, this is really front uh, to back ratio is good, you are really shooting like 400 meters, it happened like nothing uh, can shadow it, uh, seems good, but even third factor can play a role because uh, a lot of refle reflections again. This is a mirror, mirror in the environment. Yes, and, you, yeah. yeah, here we, we have to mention this. Of course, with DM signal structure, it is really robust against reflections, but it has its limits, which means uh, 2.3 microsecond cyclic prefix uh, would perhaps allow to have uh, 700 meters uh, for reflections way. And even in this kind of building, it's achievable that reflections would go longer. And immediately, if you have your reflected signal, which was OFDMA and which was delayed longer than 2.3 microseconds, what happens? It immediately goes to noise. And uh, this is also not that desirable factor. Ralph, I hope you, I, I answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Perfect answer. Thanks, Victor. And uh, we have to go further to allow also a session of questions because, uh, yeah, I do not immediately see what kind of questions you might have. So we jump to another chapter. Uh, we have to discuss also this factor of redundancy. Yeah, Remember I told you this is very uh, sensitive for the solution. I, I have to show you only two slides. Yeah, uh, This slide uh, says that uh, imagine we agreed that we have here on top a dedicated sector. This would be high capacity area. Let's say uh, cars are getting ready, really software getting to be downloaded. And we have 20% uh, overlap. And with requirement, we decided that requirement would be minus 95 dBm. And result, we get 44 review. The same story, but uh, imagine we decided to have only 5% overlapping because we decided so. We agreed with customer. And uh, we have a requirement for the border minus, minus 100 dBm. And uh, we have only 19 RRU. For both scenarios, for this and for this, it will be reasonable coverage. However, redundancy is different, yeah? And we were about to investigate a little bit more uh, this, uh, this sensitivity, yeah? And uh, created, in fact, sensitivity diagram. And uh, here, uh, using uh, nominal uh, automatic automatic uh, cell placement feature of IB wave, we simply decided to to check what happens. Yeah, if I have uh, 19 uh, dBm output power per MIMO channel, 21, 23, or 26, and of course uh, by this picture, I guess I guess it is possible to to feel the taste of uh, of decibel. Like, let's say so. Uh, so because. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, fine. and the, and the overlapping that you uh, show here, uh, it uh, makes a big difference. Yeah, if you overlap more or less. Yeah, so it's yeah. not only the output power, but it, this picture shows it very well. And uh, I will I will quickly show it uh, in the live demo how we can do that in IBM. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, again, to say that, uh, for example, if you go with uh, 26 decibel on my more channel instead of 21, perhaps you may have. Uh, 663 antennas instead of 136, yeah, which is uh, twice less antennas. And this is just because you are really sure that your power would be 26 per MIMA channel. Yeah. This way why, why, yeah, why are you doing nominal design? It's uh, either you have to do a first proposal for your end customer um, to, to, that they get a, a figure about cost expected, um, or the other one is you, you want to find out the, the best antenna positions already from the nominal design. And so it's it's a really, really great tool to to go uh, to use here. Yeah. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, nothing to disagree. Uh, Ralph, nothing to disagree. Uh, it was uh, really great to see, you know, this reactivity level of this curve. Because, for example, if you discuss with this customer, okay, uh, the requirement for the cell border would be 95 or 100. Yeah, it can be 95, but we, it will cost you... 288 antennas, for example, instead of uh, 136. And right. then discussion appears to be, let's say, more in a practical um, uh, surface, to, to say it so. Because yes, we, we, we would like to have higher, but this is costly and uh, related to oh, the- oh, at the end, yeah, that's it. Yeah. But yeah. Still, still need the, the performance to get, to get what you need in your, in your private network, right? Yeah. 
And I guess in the last uh, in the last version of IBWave, it's also really possible to choose overlapping, yes, Ralph, and to choose uh, RSRP yes, yes, yes. instead of RSSI for automatic self placement. Okay, let's go further because we have a couple, even three, five more slides to to check about coverage. Finally, coverage results uh, for let's let, as it was finally agreed with customer. We would go with 5% overlapping minus 100 dBm uh, requirement, and uh, we were able to achieve this on 77 error view. Uh, it was only antennas, and um, we covered 94% of the building with target 94, uh, which means and it's a really good point what you see in the red box here. It's like um, you have 94% uh, covered with minus 100 dBm. So depending on your design criteria, your KPI, um, you should design a network not to over-dimension or under-dimension. If you have 100% covered with that level, you probably have spent too much equipment and that increases the cost. Yeah? If you are only 90% covered with your required signals level, then you are under-dimensioned and you, you don't have the, expect, uh, the required performance of the network. So that's really, really helpful. And in IBF design, you have all these tools to, to check if yeah. you meet your requirements. Yeah, pretty Thanks. correct, Ralph. And it was uh, also was really, we, we were insisting on discussion what kind of areas we have to exclude because this 6% like uh, uh, toilets and rooms for personal has to be, they have to be ex excluded from, from calculation. And uh, the next, uh, we are drifting to performance indicators because we are calculating not only for coverage. Yeah, I'm aiming to target to, to show you also performance-related metrics, and it was also a wish from customers that we would investigate also impact of MIMO to performance. And uh, here on this picture, you see a typical RSRP distribution. Let's imagine we have only one antenna here. Yeah. So some directions like here, uh, it's blocked. You have a red here, signal is very low. The blue, of course, this is a maximum signal. Central area is again very well isolated. And uh, on the way of checking uh, how MIMA would behave, what kind of rank efficiency is achievable, on this way, we really decided uh, to try to make the best out of IB wave. And we also created a quite rarely seen metric, which is nature of the path. And uh, using this metric, we were, we attempted to understand what is favorable in terms of nature of the path for the capacity for rank uh, distribution and for throughput. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we can guess together that line of sight uh, conditions, as also Ralph mentioned, by default they are of course preferable for having simply for everything. Preferable for everything. This is in favor, but. Does it necessarily mean that if we have line of sight, is, does it does it necessarily mean that our rank indicator would be better? And uh, do shall we expect that our throughput will be better in this area where line of sight? And the answer is on this slide. Hope you can see it as well. That if we calculate a throughput, uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, blue color is representing the maximum throughput about one gigabit per second yeah and of course you remember this area is line of sight this blue color was line of sight towards this uh, south direction of the slide yeah here we do not observe the maximum throughput and of course uh, at least due to not fulfilled conditions for maximum rank, rank indicator and this this is also in line with our observations from the field from real measurements and suddenly you may get uh, an island of, of a good throughput when uh, your let's say when conditions for unbiased propagation ways are fulfilled and uh, which means not necessarily line of sight is always beneficial for throughput and this is Possibly from theoretical point of view, this is pretty predictable or visible, but another story when you have it under your control here under your IB wave project and you can play with parameters, you can even change uh, MIMO rank, uh, let's say MIMO settings and to see what kind of impact you have, which is also possible with IB wave with this instrument. And uh, the next uh, slide is relevant to overall throughput picture it is uh, at least uh, to my eyes it's not always during presentations yeah it's uh, typically we are ending on okay this is a coverage and that's it yeah this time i decided to bring a little bit uh, 
more for deep dive here. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this looks, looks great uh, because everything is blue, like like everywhere you have a one gigabit. In this case, for the two by two model, what what is the, do we have any any feedback from customer or any measurements where you know what is reality? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, reality for, uh, we have seen uh, in, for such industrial environment, measurements including also rank indicator. And uh, surprisingly, it was quite a lot of rank, uh, rank three, for example, on rank three, it was possible to achieve about 1.2 gigabit. For rank two, it was possible to achieve about 800 megabits per second, which is not far away from prediction. But again, to highlight that uh, this picture we see here, the first interesting story is that we do not observe maximum signal in line of sight in the proximity of the antenna. The second, you may have spotted already that the load factor is null, yeah, which uh, triggers you to say, Victor, what is this? It's unrealistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show us something more interesting, and which is which is here, <laughs> possibly and hopefully. Uh, we decided uh, to spend a little bit more time because initial requirement of the customer was to try to understand what kind of performance uh, they may expect under the load. And imagine that we would change the load, PDCH load, having two sectors, one sector dedicated for this finalization area here on top, and all other areas would be, for example, another sector. Imagine we have these two sectors and really, really heavy traffic here on top. And what happens if your PDCA channel gets loading between 1% and 50% what to expect and where to expect yeah and uh, uh, if you still remember what kind of leakage uh, was visible on those uh, pictures before yeah you may immediately recognize on here on this slide what is, is the most sensitive part of this industrial area where is a tiny where is the tiniest part of of this uh, network would be if you get that's a really right. low yeah, that's build the ball over there in the red area yeah because that will help yeah exactly exactly right and this is as, as you mentioned this explains why nobody from customer side would would say no to discussion about architectural changes for the building and uh, this is why actually because you see immediately that in the worst case scenario we have to consider worst case scenario scheduler in, in this scheduler of course of vendor scheduler in this case is so stupid to assign pdca channel really place to place that you really collide on this border, you see this degradation to the red color here. And perhaps you can see that distribution of uh, throughput is also changing, but of course the average value here would have right, been right. changed between 900 and 830 megabits per second. It's okay, we can tolerate this. Okay. However, here on the border, if it is really important for the customer, situation it gets a little bit more dramatic and it's a good background. It's a good background for architectural dis architectural discussion for sure. Great, great. Fully agree with that. Thanks, Victor. I think we are Thanks. short in time today, so let's uh, go back to uh, some other topics. And let me just share my screen again. So it would be this one. So hopefully you can see that. Yeah, Ralph, I can see it. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, great, great. Okay, so let's quickly go about the, the DAS system which is used over there. Yeah. So uh, in this case, uh, for that, in, uh, what you really easily can see is that um, there are a lot of components used in the in the network uh, to design that network. And the beauty of the solution is that you, in IBW design, all the components they they are. Uh, they have an inventory number, they have a cost related to it, so you can at the end make a bill of material, a cost report out of it, and you can modify at any later stage the uh, the network. So in this case it was active components uh, where you have the radio hub, radio remote hubs, you have the, the cabling over there, all in the 3D model, including the, uh, the antennas uh, at the end of each of these cables. Huh? That might be Ethernet cable might be fiber cable, depending on which vendor you're choosing at the end. Um, but in most of the cases, the, uh, the, the hub itself is connected via fiber because you have a lot of data yeah, you need uh, to transmit to the backbone. Yeah? And um, important to say here is that IBV provides a very, very large data, but the largest of is more than 37,000 components, more than 350 manufacturers. And Important is that 
the, the, the whole network design at the end, it is defined by the accuracy of the uh, components and materials you are using. So this is quite important here, and uh, which leads us to the last part here from um, looking at the, the, the coverage side. It's the outdoor and the indoor, yeah? because typically, um, Victor was talking about indoor environment, but there might be cars might need to leave the building here and uh, needs to get parked outside somewhere. And it might be auto, uh, autonomous driving machines as well. Yeah? So uh, depending if that could be cars, it could be airplanes as well, whatever yeah? you, need, you need in most of the cases for campus indoor and outdoor. And what you could, uh, what you, uh, what you could see here is there's a, there's a macro site uh, covering the outdoor part, and you see the rooftop is quite good coverage here. But if you go inside, maybe the building which is next to it, you would just immediately see that when you do random simulations for outdoor, uh, you need to have uh, coverage inside that building as well, a uh, dedicated system. So you need to design for an active in building system for this specific hall. Yeah? Um, what you can see is that we are looking here in IBW design at a flat surface. Yeah? If you are running on a larger campus, and uh, I mean really larger campus, they can be quite big. Yeah? Um, if you have oil refineries or, or anything like that, yeah? uh, harbors and things like that, they're quite large. Yeah? So you have a large outdoor network as well, and your indoor network, and both they need to talk to each other. And we have a solution which is called IBW Reach, where you can import, we can run the predictions with all the geo data on, on heights and all the levels which you have there. And, uh, run the predictions for outdoor, for macro, import them into your building and uh, in, uh, do, run your simulations, your design for your in-building network, and then export that back to the macro and see what is the impact in your macro network. Because that's at the end, you want to see who's the best server and, and things like that. So it, that's really, really, really important. And we do have a solution which is called IBW Reach, but at this time, we are short in time, so we will not talk about uh, the macro planning part of that. Yeah. So let me quickly go to a demo of the tools. One is the automatic placement, which Victor has shown to you already, um, to really make a budgetary proposal on normal design. The other one is a stencil library, which we have. Uh, the automatic small cell placement. So the automatic small cell placement is, as uh, uh, Victor said, you can play with the parameters. Yeah? and Maybe I can just jump to an IVWF design project file where you can uh, where you could see. Let me jump back to that. That can pop up. Ah, it's a bit slow here. Yeah. Screen sharing. So where you, where you can see the uh, the uh, the building itself, and maybe for that type of building, you would like to um, design for your network and automatically place uh, the different devices. So what you can do is you just select the type of uh, equipment you're choosing. And um, once you have selected that, let me go back to, to this, Let's see, it's getting quite, quite slow right now. Something is this transmission still works because it seems that it is somehow frozen my screen. Uh -huh. Let me see. Maybe I have to skip that. My screen seems to be frozen for now. Yes, let me just. Skip back to the presentation in that case. Hopefully that will work. Now that screen is frozen. Um, so you can play with these parameters. It's like he said, minus 95 dBm output power. And the number of resulting small cells is uh, your nominal plan which you have. So if you play these, could be a very, very large number. You can play with the overlapping zone uh, as well. High, medium, small, so you can set the, as mentioned, maybe 30% of overlapping, uh, which is like medium, and then the resulting, uh, the number of access points will change immediately. Right? And based on that, you can do your nominal planning and you get your first 
bill of material for your network. Um, the other one is the, the stencil library. And the stencil library, it uh, allows you really to model for any kind of object. If it's a robot, if it's uh, the HEVs, if it's cars, airplanes, yeah, doors, windows, whatever you have in your manufacturing area, you can simply model and track and drop on your floor plan. Because what, uh, what Victor said in the beginning, it might be a big challenge um, to, uh, to design for, uh, a, uh, to create a 3D model. Um, yeah, in this case, it's, it's quite easy because uh, you have a library of different components, objects you're using in your manufacturing uh, area. You just track and drop and place them over there. Yeah. Yeah, it would be very useful right, for the next projects we do, uh, because yes. uh, also for this uh, uh, car assembly hall, uh, it was a lot of components which were, which could be reused later on. You can imagine, so if you have uh, uh, technical appliances, they are more or less similar in any kind of industry, and we, we could reuse it. I find personally this feature yes. is very useful. For, and the, for uh, the big advantage here is that you, you can create your own library, but you can share it as well with, uh, with the other users. Uh, who are designing uh, together with you in uh, the project. Yeah? So it, you just need to design it once and then you can reuse them. Yeah? It's like a template, you save that. Yeah? It's really, uh, it's a cool feature coming now. So it's a sneak peek, yeah? it will come now uh, soon and be available for you to, especially for the manufacturing area. I think that's a big, big, big advantage designing your 3D model of the building very, very fast. Yeah? Okay, so that leads to the last part for today the conclusion and uh yeah i would i would say the conclusion here is for any kind of private networks you really need to have a digital twin of your network and this is not only as victor presented it's the the throughput the coverage for indoor the the complete network components with all the cables and everything used um, not the outdoor part only you know, it's all together you need to have as a digital twin of your network so that you have everything or in place future proof if you decide to uh, uh, to uh, to really uh, go from existing technology you have you will add maybe iot you have iot devices wi-fi network you, you might add 4g 5g and at the later stage there's 6g coming yeah so a digital twin helps you really to react fast and be future proof yeah and uh, that's supporting your long-term roadmap, which is important for private networks. Yeah? And as I said at the beginning, you, you need to react very, very fast for any changing environment because you have to product, uh, the production line will be changed in the manufacturing for a new upcoming product. You have to change everything, so you need to be fast. Only a digital twin will help you uh, to do that. Yes. Yeah. So, Correct, right. And I think that a bit uh, one comment to it that uh, IBWave also allows, uh, let's say, appropriate investigation in terms of uh, impact of overlapping yeah it allows to see the load factors uh, impact from load yeah and this is for us at least our experience says it is really good background for the proper discussion with this customer we find it very useful yes thanks Victor. um daniel a few words about the uh, training and certifications sure so we don't have much time but uh you know since we still want to take some time for your questions i'm gonna just briefly mention the IBA training and certifications so at our wave farms platforms which is at community.ibwave.com certifications that's where you can access all our IBA certifications we have also modules standalone courses or even free courses that we offer online in virtual classes or in person and in fact we have just added a few new certifications and courses and one of them, which is interesting, is Ivy Wave Private Networks uh, Certifications, which is a new online course uh, that's available online. So you can uh, access this at any time. Uh, we have also virtual classes for Ivy Wave Level 1 and 2 uh, that's coming up in July and August. And uh, one new course is on Fundamentals of Private Networks, which is also a new online 30-minute short course. So with that, uh, we can go straight to your questions. And um, we got quite many, so I'll just read them out loud. And for those that we won't be able to answer today, uh, we'll get back to you by email afterwards. So let me start with this one. Um, it's about how can I satisfy the C of cost in countries where you need leverage only MNO to get frequencies? 
Yeah, unfortunately, uh, yeah, that, that's the that's the the problem of uh, frequency uh, spectrum availability in the different countries. In some countries, you already have private network dedicated frequencies. Like here in Germany, we are lucky we have we have that 100 megahertz band in 37 to 38. Uh, there's millimeter band available as well. In other countries in Europe, it's it's the same. But uh, if you don't have any uh, any allocated spectrum for private networks, you have to go to the mobile, uh, to the public network operators. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, can't, you can't build up your, your own private network, right? All right, thanks, Ralph. Uh, I think we can take maybe five minutes more just to go a little over time. And this, uh, is, and this is just maybe just to add that it's it's this is what the pri uh, the, the public network operators they offer uh, for customers private networks, but then they are hosted by by the uh, mobile network operator. Right? So that, that that's, that's always just a, a solution you can go for. Right? Sure. So the next question is uh, from Mark, and he's asking, I would be interested in understanding how core redundancy slash resiliency was implemented and UE convergence and a core failure situation? Uh, good question. I don't know if I get that right, but it's, uh, it's about core or it's more about redundancy? Redundancy on the core uh, side, uh, I guess. Yeah, right. so, this is something uh, on the core network. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, we are not uh, considering here. For, for, or we can say that uh, this uh, link between uh, core part can be also resolved on, on optical way, but this is, I don't think this question about this. It is rather about core part itself, which was out of focus for this uh, wireless yes. study. There's an IBB uh, design solution for fiber networks where you can design the fiber to the building, the fiber to the campus, fiber to the home. Um, there's a separate solution available for that from, from IBW. Um, but uh, for the core network itself, this is, uh, this is not part of the, uh, the IBW design package. All right. Yes, Victor? Yeah, I just wanted to mention any uh, RF-related uh, uh, deep dive questions, Daniel, on, on, the, on the side, because perhaps we can take one more to just to see if if we triggered any RF-related interest with these pictures, with those pictures. All right. Yep, uh, I'll just continue with the next question. Um, could these design ideas, uh, the ones that we talked about previously, support building a small outdoor campus network that ties together about 25 homes over a one mile area and what type of speeds would be achievable uh, the first part is clear uh, i would say yes it is possible uh, and uh, it's even sometimes reasonable to use uh, ibw design for that and uh, daniel could you please repeat this last part of the question sure sure uh, the last part of the question is asking about what types of speed would be achievable. Ah, depending on your bandwidth, obviously. So the values you have seen today, this is for 100 uh, megahertz spe spectrum, 3.7, 3.8, with 90% uh, of uh, downlink slots. So, and depending on MIMO, two by two, I have shown to you, yeah? Four by four will, would be higher up to probably two gigabit per second. For your scenario, yeah, the best way, the best way always to check uh, the formula, which is in line with 3GPP, what is the maximum you can achieve under a certain downlink uplink pattern. Yeah, and for for the given bandwidth, of course. And this is pretty open formula. You you perhaps could could take it for for calculation and then again to compare with with results you, you get possibly. Yeah. Maybe, maybe to add here that in IV wave design, you can uh, define the parameters for uplink, downlink, how many time slots you have, and uplink, how many in downlink, and like that. So yeah, and there's a little, lot of parameters you can add, uh, enter there to get the right results at the end. Yeah, and even a SNR curve is possible to adjust, so it's yes. pretty flexible in terms of. Uh, Depending on the uh, on the OEM, on the vendor of the equipment, things like you have, you, have, you can adjust these parameters, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So we have time maybe for one or two more questions. So one uh, goes back to when we talked about Wi-Fi. Uh, so Julian is asking, you can also own a Wi-Fi network. So why is it flagged as low security? 
Yeah, because yeah. Wi-Fi Wi-Fi licenses are not. Uh, 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 I mean, it's it's shared shared medium, yeah, Wi-Fi. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, the, the, I mean if you if you have a uh, someone who's uh, switching on his mobile with uh, with a hotspot, yeah, it could be inter interfere your your network, yeah, as well. Yeah, very quick way of answer, correct, Ralph. It's. Uh, uncontrolled interference because uh, any anyone can launch this frequency and even if you have a very dedicated frequency uh, mobility it would be a second question for this system and of course this is not that sophisticated uh, on on rf level as, as such so it's really less preferable to have wi-fi for such uh, highly responsibility areas as a car assembly area manufacturer. all right so maybe we can answer one last question. Uh, we might have already touched on that, uh, but I'll just still read it so we can answer Alan. Uh, he's asking, on car manufacturing plants, will metal objects have effect on private LTE network? If it does, how can we fix the issue? Uh, actually, the good part of our presentations was about this effect from, effect from metal. Yeah, as I said, it's a really heavy reflection scenario and uh, we have to let's say to be aware about robustness limit of OFDM signal as such and uh, as I said uh, for example attempt to use uh, high directivity antennas can lead us to uh, intersymbol interference because OFDM cannot digest any more the ref reflections which are coming like more than 2.3 microseconds later of initial signal and if you cannot digest those reflections it's immediately becoming a noise but this is uh, it is also valid for uh, industrial band 3.7 which means you need to take care about reflections first of all you need to be sure that your diagram has no obstacles in the near field because if something goes to your near field you cannot count on the antenna diagram anymore you cannot count it would be as predicted and i think it's correct to say that even antenna diagram termin as such it is only defined for the far field which means if you enter near field scenario you don't have your diagram anymore and the second is the objects which are in your near field can become a second source of your signal uh, like a director and reflector typical typical case of antenna so simply those factors to take care about and to avoid them yeah careful carefully to be really attentive where antenna is placed uh, the footprint and perhaps the good model the better the model the better the prediction the better the assumption about antenna amount on this is exactly the way we i wanted at least to show you our experience and hopefully you you find it useful somehow all right thank you victor so unfortunately we are eight minutes over now so we'll have to end the session but uh don't worry we'll get back to you as soon as possible with the rest of the questions and uh if you have any more follow-up questions please don't hesitate and reach out to either one of us or sales at iduwave.com and we'll answer any questions that you might have uh, also we'll share with you the presentation and the recording so you will have this uh, all in the next few days so thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, this was a great session. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you in the next webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, it'll be very Thanks glad everyone. to see your questions after all. Yeah, so shoot it uh, to the chat or shoot it later. Uh, I promise to attempt to re reply all of them. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Thanks a lot, Daniel. And everyone on the bridge, have a good day or rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank have a you. nice day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.